So um, welcome everyone. Uh, we're here tonight with Chris Kennedy. He's the assistant director of the Urban Systems Lab, the new school, and a lecturer at the Parsons School of Design. Uh, his research focuses on understanding the social ecological benefits of spontaneous urban plant communities and the role of civic engagement in developing new approaches to environmental stewardship and nature-based resilience. Kennedy is now based in Austin, Texas, where he creates site-specific projects and examines conventional notions of nature, interspecies agency, and biocultural collaboration. So everyone, welcome, Chris. Thank you, Angel. Oh, so great to be here, everybody. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, I've known Angel for just a few months, but she's plugged me into all the things. So I'm really happy to be joining y'all. Um, I'm new to the Austin area, originally from the New York, New Jersey world. But um, my partner and I are here based in Austin now. We're in the Cherrywood neighborhood, which is really wonderful. Um, so excited to be a part of the Texas community. Um, today, I thought I would just share with you a little bit of research that I've been working on over the last few years and also from the lab that I'm affiliated with and um, hopefully just engage in a, a really cool dialogue with everybody here. Um, I pieced this together from a few lectures and a few you know, recent um, investigations I've been working on. So let me know if things get too academic, too boring. Um, we can make it more of an informal conversation at any point. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can get going here. All right. Everybody see that okay? Great. All right, so as, as Angel mentioned, my name is Chris Kennedy and um, I am an urban ecologist and researcher at the New School University. Um, which is located in New York City. Um, luckily, I've been able to work mostly remote um, during the pandemic um, and continue to be affiliated with the lab there in New York City, but seeing a lot of overlaps to the Texas area as well that I'll touch base on. I thought I would just open up today's um, lecture with a really nice quote from one of my favorite authors. I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with Robin Wall Kimmerer who's an amazing indigenous scholar um, in the SUNY system in New York um, and does a lot of really cool research about relationships between people and plants and particularly indigenous communities. And she has this you know, beautiful quote that I've kind of paraphrased from you know, one of her well-known books, Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, and it goes, the spontaneous plants that emerge in damaged landscapes are a form of peacemaking where a community of weedy species can be a partner in restoration. And I just think that's kind of beautiful to think about weeds as, as, a, as a form, as a, as a gift, as she might describe it, and as a form and an opportunity to be in a reciprocal relationship with the landscape. And so I want to kind of just, you know, explode and, and open up that concept a little bit through some of today's discussion. And also just to take a moment to acknowledge the land that we're on right now, the Comanche, Apache, uh, Lipan, um, Indian or indigenous communities here that are now known as Austin, Texas, right? So just to acknowledge the people that were here before us, I think is really important. So I divided up today's talk into four sections. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the idea of cities as complex systems, right? How do we sort of understand as we approach the, you know, almost the middle of the 21st century, right? The expansion of urban centers around the world, and then also to talk about the, um, the idea of novel ecosystems, which some people might be familiar with, right? Weedy, ritual landscapes, right? And how they intersect with urban communities. I'll touch base on a New York City-based case study that we conducted back in 2016 to 2019, looking at urban vacant lands in New York City and its potential for um, different kinds of ecosystem services. And then I wanna conclude by um, talking about this idea of multi-species thinking and how this can kind of um, inform gardening practices, landscape ecology practices, and all different kinds of ways of thinking about conservation or restoration in new ways. So just to you know, start off too with a few disclaimers, right? 
The idea here is not to make a case for or against weeds. I just want to talk about them. <laughs> um, and a lot of this is based on some research, research, but also literature reviews that I've conducted over the last few years. And I want to talk about the emergence of novel ecosystems and the potential, right, for um, you know providing different kinds of resilient strategies in cities. Right. I want to note that in some cases, invasive management strategies are needed. Right. We need to be in relationship to landscapes. Right. So I'm not trying to make a case against all different kinds of invasive management, but to just take a step back and think critically about that approach, right, the conventional approaches. And if you have a question about weeds in your backyard, I'm not the best person to ask, right? I'm still getting used to the Texas landscape. So I'm probably not gonna have a lot of feedback or opinions about a specific plant, right? But we can talk more generally about it. Okay, great. All right, so I wanted to start with a picture of my hometown, my, my, the place that I grew up in Wall Township, New Jersey, right? If you look at this photograph, it looks like a pretty unassuming, right? Landscape, pretty typical house. It's got a flag outside, we've got some bushes, we've got a deck, right? Um, but if we look across the street, this is what I grew up with. This is an abandoned Christmas tree farm, right? That has left gone wild over the last several decades, right? And so every time I would wake up and go outside, I would encounter right all different kinds of species of plants, right? I didn't realize that at the time, but most of these are considered either invasive or not from the area originally. Um, and I actually found that these things were kind of quite beautiful. I was really attracted to the borders, right? This way that they spilled over onto the streets. If you go just two blocks from where I grew up, I live by a highway. And this is what you see, right? Along the edges of most roadways and urban areas you see all different kinds of species of what we would consider, right, non-native species of plants, right, kind of thriving along these edges. And it's oftentimes because that's where you can't fit a mower, right? You can't get your weed whacker easily in there. And so you're creating these kind of interesting accidental habitats for all different kinds of species, right? And so I think that this, you know, kind of experience of living in these kind of hyper urban areas is changing, right, our attitudes and beliefs towards different kinds of landscape forms. And for me, it was actually a, a kind of sense of excitement and really trying to understand what was happening, right? Why is this, right, considered bad, right? Or not, um, as, as they were saying earlier, ugly, right? Compared to um, a manicured space like a lawn or um, a golf course. So if we take a, a really close look, what we find is there's diversity of different kinds of species. Some of them are native, some of them are non-native, right? Some of them are naturally occurring, right? And they're co-mingling and finding synergies between each other, right? And so for me, this is really fascinating, right? What is happening here, right? What are the drivers of these different phenomena and how could we potentially use them as a way of thinking about resilience strategies, right? In urban centers across the US and world. So one of my other hats is the co-director of a research lab called the Urban Systems Lab in the New School. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about a case study that we conducted um, a few years back. So just to give folks a little bit of context of where I'm coming from, the research lab is really focused on envisioning the future of cities, right? And we think about that in all different kinds of ways, but one of the main focuses is to really think about equity and justice, right? Through the lens of urban resilience. Right, so we have a number of different research teams looking at things like urban flood risk or how hot it might get, um, how cities are changing over time, right? And what can we do in the most effective ways to actually make sure that the most socially vulnerable communities right, get the resources they need. Our entire lab is really focused on the strategy that we call SETS, right? Looking at cities in terms of social, ecological and technological systems, right? And really thinking about the linkages, right? How do they connect? right? And how are the disparate, right? And this kind of lens allows us to think about complexity in all different kinds of ways, right? And especially when we start to think about, right, what are the best green infrastructure or resilient strategies to really make sure that they're targeting, again, these socially vulnerable communities that we're thinking about equity throughout. So some of the outputs of the lab, we produce maps, data visualizations, different kinds of research and white papers that really look at different ways that cities can use data that's either publicly available or new or emerging data to actually inform decision-making. And a lot of this takes the form of different kinds of data visualizations. 
So I'll just share really quickly the data visualization platform that we use quite often in the lab. We have about nine cities on this platform currently, and it's really cool that it allows you to look at these different kinds of social, ecological, technological layers together, right? So this is a map here of New York City. Hopefully you can see this okay. And what's really nice is that you can look at something like coastal flooding, right? And it gives you a sense of which areas might be affected most, but also to look at different kinds of social economic data, right? Like where are socially vulnerable communities located, right? And then how can we potentially target, right? The best interventions and decision-making strategies, right? In different kinds of ways. And this is really kind of, you know, maybe intuitive or maybe you think it's an obvious thing, but it's not how most decision-making is, is taken into account at the city or municipal level, right? We're looking at ecological issues separately, social issues separately, and that's where we get a lot of conflicts. So the goal of the lab is really to kind of bring those pieces together so we have kind of a more clear and more comprehensive understanding. I'm also coming at this as an artist too. So I helped to co-found a really cool group called the Environmental Performance Agency. We're a group of artists that mostly based in New York City. And we came together um, after Trump was elected and realized that the Environmental Protection Agency was going to be dismantled and defunded. And so we decided to create our own EPA to really think about stewardship and urban ecology in different kinds of ways. And so we use dance and movement to get people onto the streets interacting and engaging with plants, right? And oftentimes plants in the city means weeds. And we find that these encounters can kind of build a new kind of empathy and relationship with an urban environment. On the photograph to the right here, you can see a workshop that I did with a local artist named Ann Armstrong. And we were doing a kind of weedy border tour of the Laguna Gloria Sculpture Park back in May. All right, so that's a little bit of where I'm coming from, but um, I want to start off with just a little bit of context, right? So we can kind of get in our minds how we can start thinking about these new landscapes, uh, forms and different kinds of plants that we're now encountering in cities, right? Now, over the past 50 years, I'm sure folks are mostly aware is that urbanization has increased dramatically across the globe, right? Um, by 2030, the UN is predicting that 68%, the majority of the world's population will either live or move to a city. But the really interesting thing is that by 2050, right, a large percentage of those urban areas have yet to be designed, right? So there's a really cool potential to really rethink and reimagine how we think about urban systems dynamics, right, and the future of cities more generally. If we look at urban population growth, right, it's exploded across the US, right? And Austin is actually a really unique case, right? When we think about the census data from 2010 to 2020, right, we've seen a 33% increase in population growth in the Austin metro area. And this is a trend that you've seen across the globe, right? Now, the impacts of this are dramatic, right? We've seen all different kinds of climate issues, right, really become more prevalent over the last 10 years, everything from increased heat waves, like flooding, all different kinds of impacts to agriculture, economic impacts, right? And this is driving, right, and in a tangent with urbanization, right? Climate and urbanization are going together a lot of different ways, right? This is a map of the Austin area that I found kind of interesting that really sort of tells you the story of how this entire area has expanded, right? Horizontally and vertically, right? In many different kinds of ways over the last 10 years, right? The areas in purple denote different kinds of growth in terms of population. And in a general Texas area, right? There's a lot of implications for cities increasing, right? In terms of their size, but also the population, right? Demands on resources are a key concern, right? Water, food, all different kinds of disruptions and services. I was here during the winter freeze in February last year um, and never really experienced such a huge kind of infrastructure issue, um, even after living through Hurricane Sandy and different kinds of events in New York. This was kind of a, a special unique case, right? It seems like in a lot of ways, Texas is not necessarily prepared or resilient for a lot of these emerging threats, right? And this is a map that's coming from the Planet Texas 2050 initiative out of UT. And they're doing some really great work about thinking about resilience strategies moving forward. 
So all of this is to say, right, that cities are now complex urban systems, right? When we think about cities, right, they're no longer just like a simple grid of buildings and people, right? They're a moving kind of tapestry of different kinds of, of, of dynamics, right? So there's lots of interesting terms and theories, right? Everything from patch dynamics to urban mosaics, right? To describe this phenomena and also do sort of theories of resilience, right? To really understand the unique kind of urban condition. One of the kind of work that we're doing in our lab is really thinking about this idea of the meta city, right? And this is a concept that's been developed by a lot of different researchers um, that we are affiliated with, that thinking about cities in terms of non-linear and adaptive systems, right? These kind of clustering effects, these patch dynamics, right? And how they start to define urban spaces, right? In the 21st century. And we're seeing all different kinds of interesting impacts to the urban environments, right? Things like rapid urban evolution, right? Species literally learning how to change their genetic traits, right? Or their functions, right? Over a short duration of time, right? 10, 20, 30 years, right? Actually plants or different kinds of animals, insects, right? Changing a response to urban environments, right? So for example, on the left, the Creptus santa, which is a plant that's very sort of similar to the dandelion, um, has actually changed its genetic sort of code in order to make their seeds drop directly down to the ground, right? So they're no longer um, being spread by the wind or water. They've actually increased the, the mass size of the seeds so they can get into the cracks of a sidewalk, which is really interesting. Different kinds of lizards are learning to change the shape of their hands so that they can adhere to the surfaces of cement or different kinds of urban environments, right? And then these white garden snails are actually changing their color to blend in with different kinds of, of impervious surfaces. And then the last study here that is on the screen is um, a really cool project coming out of Fordham University, Jason Monsi South, who's been doing a lot of cool research about white-footed mouse and deer mice and how they've actually changed right, their genetic makeup based on the fragmentation of the habitat, right? Especially as Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island have all kind of dispersed into different areas, roadways and highways, right? The, the different kinds of species have actually learned to adapt to that. And this has all happened within the last 10, 20, 30 years. Pass by this. And we're also seeing the emergence of new landscape forms, right? So these are just some images that I pieced together from um, a few places in New York City and Pennsylvania, down to Virginia, kind of showing you the variety of different landscapes that are now emerging in urban areas, right? Things that we would consider novel or rural. So what does this all mean? Like, what are the implications here? So despite you know, these cities becoming more complex, right? Novel ecosystems becoming more um, abundant, more common in urban areas, we're still using outdated management practices to take care of these landscapes or to be in relationship to them, right? And this has a lot of implications. So I just wanna kind of touch on that and sort of think about where is that kind of coming from, right? Why are we still stuck in some of these kind of loops here? Now, in large part, urban ecology or just ecology or generally, right, has subscribed to this idea of ecological stability, right? We have this assumption that ecosystems can bounce back from a disturbance, right? There's this inherent sort of um, tendency towards balance, right? And what we're finding is that's not actually true, right? Ecosystems can't be easily restored and then all of a sudden look like they did when they were in 1600 or 1200 BC, right? It's just almost nearly impossible to restore them fully to those kind of you know, historical sort of systems, right? But a lot of management practices, restoration, conservation, are still premised on this idea of ecological stability, right? New theories of resilience have kind of pushed back against this, right? So this idea of, of resilience thinking, right? Resilience in terms of um, how systems operate, right? It's become more popular um, over the last few decades, right? 1970s, Crawford Holling sort of devised this sort of concept of social ecological system dynamic and resilience, right? that systems can be adaptive and elastic, right? They change and they do sort of bounce back, but they also go back down, right? It's kind of these like changing dynamics over time. And some of the key questions that people are asking now is for resilient for whom, for why, right? Um, and for what? 
And so when we think about land management approaches, right, we're still kind of stuck in these cycles, right, where we're using either um, mechanical controls, chemical controls, um, prescribed burnings, right, all different kinds of strategies that are often not long-term successful. They're often expensive, they're carbon intensive, right? They just essentially don't work in a lot of um, areas. And that's not to say that there's some successes, right, and need for this, right? Um, on the right-hand side, you can see this picture of one of the largest restoration efforts undertaken in the U.S. in Lake Tahoe, right? And the kind of simplicity of just simply putting a black tarp over the sides, right, to get some of these phragmites to suffocate on the side of the these, these kind of creeks that are feeding into tributaries here, right? Right. How how can we think differently about this, right? Is this actually the best strategy moving forward, considering that we do have a climate crisis, an urbanization crisis, and all different kinds of challenges facing us ahead. One of the consequences of these conventional control strategies is the use of pesticides, right? And I'm sure everybody here in the garden club knows that pesticides are not necessarily great, right, for urban ecosystems or ecosystems generally, right? But we're actually seeing the increase in herbicide and pesticide use across the globe, you know, particularly in different kinds of agricultural arenas, right? And this has a huge, huge impact, not only on human health, but more than human health. So in response, a lot of researchers, especially the ones that I'm working with, have developed new models, right? You think about these as terms of social ecological resilience, right? Um, to thinking about social systems and ecological systems kind of coming together. And the stuff that we're doing in our lab is really thinking also about infrastructure and technological systems, right? To think about all these things in terms of how they interact or relate to each other, right? And this is kind of the, the future, especially in the urban ecology world, is to think about cities within this kind of context here. And so what does that mean? So just to kind of give you an example of a study that we recently published, um, we were looking at uh, New York City as a case and really trying to understand how ecosystem services or the benefits right, of ecosystems to people um, and other organisms, how are they distributed across the city? And what we found in our analysis is that there's actually a huge mismatch, right? The low income, those vulnerable communities who need those services and benefits are not actually getting them, right? We tend to put trees and parks in wealthier, um, higher income areas, right? Despite not necessarily having as much need as other areas of the city, right? And so the social ecological systems kind of perspective allows us to look at social vulnerability indicators, ecological indicators together in the same space. And then just one other example, we were looking specifically most recently at urban tree canopies, right? Where are the most um, benefits right, being received in cities? We looked at 10 different kind of case studies, cities across the US, and we found that urban tree canopies are providing the most benefit, again, to lower income people of color um, that tended to live, you know, sort of outside of the urban core, right? And again, this, this kind of social ecological resilience sort of model allows us to look at those indicators in the same space. So we're left with some key challenges, right? Cities are complex. They're more of course cosmopolitan in terms of the landscape, right? We need adaptive resilient strategies, but we're still relying on these kind of conventional methods. And like I said, there's unique opportunity, right? 17 to 25% of land in most cities is considered vacant, right? Or underutilized. So there's a lot of potential for how we can reimagine cities moving forward. So let's look at some of the solutions. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about novel ecosystems and folks, let me know if there's a pulse to if I need to slow down or maybe take a pause for questions, I'm happy to do so. So when we think about novel ecosystems, one of the first kind of historical moments is um, this really great urban ecologist Herbert Zurkoff, who was a German um, scientist and right after World War II, he was living in Berlin at the time and noticed there was all these strange plants all of a sudden coming out of the earth, right? Outside of the periphery of Berlin. And he started to look closely at the sites, especially the bombed out craters. And what he noticed was that there was a distribution of species from all over the world that were all of a sudden in Europe, right? 
in a lot of ways, that was because of the conflict, right? People literally bringing their boots, right? Or even bombs across different borders, right? And starting to distribute seeds in all different kinds of ways. And of course, there's all different kinds of examples of that, right? The transatlantic slave trade, right? The ballast of ships brought in soil and hay from different parts, parts of the world, brought that to the new world. And so we have this whole mixing of species, our richness and diversity since that time. But Sukhoff's study was the first one to really sort of think about, right, how these different species are producing different kinds of landscapes and systems, and considered one of the first kind of forays into urban ecology science. Since then, we've had um, a lot of folks look at the sort of, um, you know, idea of novel ecosystems. And essentially, they're self-assembling biotic communities, right, that emerge primarily from sites of disturbance or where there's been human activity, right? And we see evidence of this all over, right? I'm sure you've seen like maybe a vacant lot or a space by the highway, a roadside, a coastal embankment, right? That's been impacted, right? By construction, urbanization, human activity. And after those disturbances, you see all different kinds of plants and organisms emerge, right? As an opportunity where they sort of take advantage of the disturbance in different ways. And this is what they look like, right? If we think about different kinds of habitats and typologies of novel ecosystems, these are just a, a sampling of the variety you might see, right, in the city near you, right? These are mostly from New York City. Um, everything from, you know, these kind of traffic islands to plants growing out of the walls of bricks, right? Or the gutters, right, of your building. You, know, you see examples of these kind of novel ecosystems emerging in every city and urban area right across the world now. And it's also important to note too, right? This idea of, of disturbed landscapes is not necessarily anything new, right? Especially in Europe where there's been more of a, a long tradition of living in relationship with landscapes, especially things like forestry or urban agriculture, right? Right, we have this idea of cultural landscapes, right? Which really denotes the relationship between people and landscapes over time, right? And really recognizing that humans have kind of been in relationship to land for quite a bit, right? And they've disturbed it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing, right? And oftentimes taking care of landscapes can be good too, right? When we think about food production or keeping a forest healthy, right? These are examples of cultural landscapes. And so today we're left with a few debates, right? Are these weedy species the driver, right, of different kinds of responses, right, to, in terms of biodiversity loss, food webs being disrupted, or are they just the passengers, right? There's also a huge debate about, right, how do we think historically about how we call plants, right? You know, the, the North American context we sort of assume 1600, right? When Columbus, right, right, just before he discovered, quote unquote, the new world, right, as the kind of cutoff, right, for when we think about plants as being native or non-native, right? In Europe, it's totally different, right? There's a totally different way of thinking about that historical continuity, right? And so there's a huge debate about what is that kind of cutoff? Do we even need to have a defined time, right? And who decides? There's also shifting definition. I'm sure you've seen tons and tons and tons of ways to label plants, right, that are considered, right, weedy in different ways, right? So it's just kind of a smattering of some of the shifting definitions you might see out there, right? A lot, a lot of debate in terms of how we legally define, right, certain plants that are unwanted or pests, right? Some of my favorite ones, especially that you find in the literature and also in legal jargon is this idea of a noxious plant or a noxious weed, right? Which is very much connected to agricultural and economic activity. If it doesn't have economic value, doesn't have agricultural or food value, it's not considered important, right? Or if it impacts agriculture, that's considered dangerous, right? So again, we have this kind of human lens, right? Plants are only here for us to consume, right? And use and for human benefit. And that kind of gets us into a little bit of a sticky spot. One of the terms that I like the most um, is this idea of naturally occurring plants, right? So we sort of get out of this idea of a non-native or native plants, and we sort of think about 
locally site-specific plants in different ways. And so that's kind of the term that I typically use when I encounter a weed as a naturally occurring plant. Now, getting back to what Mary was saying um, at the very beginning of, of the meeting, right, there's a lot of different kinds of perceptual issues we have to think about as well, right, in terms of novel ecosystems, right? For a lot of people, seeing a wild, untended space can be really jarring, right? And it assumes, right, that I'm not taking care of a landscape, right? And so there's a really cool uh, researcher Joan Nasser, who was really pivotal in thinking about like kind of landscape perception. And she developed this idea of cues to care, which I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with. And this is kind of a theory that um, humans, right, in terms of ones that have been socialized in different kinds of ways, right, tend to care more about um, landscapes that sort of, you know, like a, a, a front lawn or an area, right, that connotes care, right? Somebody is sort of managing it on some level that we're attracted to that as opposed to a kind of wild and messy landscape, right? And so a lot of this is about kind of peeling back and unlearning some of those trained habits of assuming weeds are bad or that certain plants that you don't necessarily recognize right away as being bad, right? You know, why is this mowed down lawn beautiful and this other one not, right? And this kind of cues to care theory sort of helps us a little bit with understanding that. Now, there are a lot of legal implications here, right? So I'm not gonna go into it too, too much, right? But um, in most municipal ordinance and code, right, there are rules about weeds, right? In the city of Austin, you're not allowed to grow anything above 12 inches, right? It is considered an unsanitary condition or a code violation, you know, especially if it's in your front yard, right? And so it's really kind of a question of like the eye of the beholder, right? Who gets to decide, right? Um, if something is considered a weed um, and if it's over 12 inches in a lot of ways, right? But you can sort of see the, the way that it's framed here in the code, right? And how that gets, it starts to inform, right? Um, the way that we manage landscapes in, in terms of urban areas. I thought I would share this video. I don't know if you all have seen this. This is from the city of Austin they have these kind of little code videos. And this is one they specially made for weeds. And I thought we could maybe look at this and maybe talk about it together. At the Austin Code Department, we know how easy it is to take city codes for granted. So we invited some folks in to give them some info. Do I agree with all the city codes? No, oh, man, I don't. I don't agree with all of them, you know? Grass is meant to grow, that's its purpose, man. And as humans, we shouldn't try to fight that. Meadow loves nature, but unfortunately, sometimes nature can get a little out of control. There are certain restrictions. My question for you is, who's creating these codes, you know? And who's creating the code creator's codes? Well, Meadow, the city codes and ordinances are created by elected city officials, so actually, you have a say in creating codes. I got a couple of ideas for codes, you know? If you're standing in line, you should have to hold hands with the person in front of you and behind you. Like, that should be a code, man. There are negative things in growing your grass out of control, like rodents, bugs, and trash can get trapped in there. So that's why we set these codes, so that we can keep it safe. I get it, man. I get it. It's like a bigger purpose, you know? It's like the code of Austin, man. And uh, I'm a patriot, you know? So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna get behind it. Just trim it down some. She can still have the beauty of nature without it being out of control. She was so great, you know? She really helped me out. Oh, hey, man. Oh, that's my friend, Moonchild. We're you can sort of see what they're trying to get. They're trying to be funny about this. But what I hate about this is this assumption that if you want your grass to grow a little more than 12 inches on your property, that you're all of a sudden a hippie, you smoke weed, right? You're awful, right? And that you need to conform to this kind of simple gesture, right? And so these kind of ordinances and these legal implications really lock us into thinking about landscapes and plants in a very particular way, right? Has anybody seen this video? like so funny to me. I'm just like, who funded this from the city? <laughs> it's good, fun to talk about this at some point. At the Austin Code Department, right. we... 
Right, and then we also see this in the popular media, right? And I've been sort of tracking these stories for quite a bit, right? But a lot of the, the headlines, especially around invasive species are, are very warlike and sort of connote this idea of fighting and battling against plants, right? That they're taking over, right? That they're strangling people, that they're killing things, right? They're hellish, unstoppable villains, right? And so these kind of discourses and narratives that really use warlike language, right, can be kind of problematic, right? right? And it really sort of assumes that there's only one way to think about an ecological system, right? And again, it's, it's good to highlight that we need to have management strategies, but the rhetoric around it, right, might need to be rethought. We're also seeing the emergence of these groups that are called weed warriors, right? And these are groups specifically put together to go out and kill plants, right? It's not necessarily about being in relationships, about managing, about caring for landscapes. It's about battling against the weedy scourge, right? So again, we're like, we're teaching this new generation less about stewardship and care, right? And more about killing something, right? Because we assume it has no value, right? And so just thinking critically about what does that mean? What are we sort of passing on here? And there's all different kinds of real world implications, right? This is not just about plants, but these kind of mindsets trickle into a lot of different kinds of social institutions in different ways, right? And begin to inform our everyday experience, right? We even think about the kind of relationship to the way we label plants as alien invaders and immigrants as unwanted, right? And scary, right? There's like these interesting parallels that start to emerge in the way that we think about people and plants and their relationships more generally. So there's some really cool new research, right? So I wanna share just kind of a few samplings of studies that have come out over the last 10 years that are showing that novel and regional ecosystems actually do provide benefits to cities and can be leveraged in different kinds of ways to um, ensure that folks have an equitable and healthy um, urban experience, right? Now, one of the um, pivotal um, articles and studies came out of you know, the, the Journal of Science uh, back in 2013 and it was really thinking about this idea of biodiversity, right? Biodiversity is the number one thing that people bring up in terms of novel ecosystems um, being bad, right? In different kinds of contexts, right? And this kind of systematic review that was conducted found, right? That there was actually no conclusive evidence, right? That global species extinction was being driven by invasive species, right? That the, actually the, the reasons why we're seeing these huge biodiversity losses are because of us, right? It's because of human activity, because of climate change and because of urbanization, that's not necessarily a plant choosing to come over here um, and ravage an ecosystem. It's because of how we've managed the landscapes more generally, right? And this is very much like controversial in botany conservation land, which is really looking at specific kind of you know, studies of island ecosystems or a very particular kind of plant that's disrupting one area and not necessarily thinking about these kind of global systems, right? So, Novel ecosystems provide a ton of ecosystem services, right? Again, this is just a fancy way of saying the benefits, right, to human and more than human communities. And there's been a lot of really great studies that have come out to sort of show that novel ecosystems in some contexts, right, and brutal ecologies can actually increase biodiversity. They can help with air quality issues, soil quality issues, stormwater absorption, carbon sequestration, all different kinds of regulating services that we associate with a lot of different kinds of of the ecosystems, right? Now, the, the rates at which those are happening compared to, right, what we would call a native landscape, right, uh, is really a debate, right? So we think about, right, are the benefits um, versus a novel and a historically continuous system the same? There are also provisioning services, right? So a lot of these landscapes can be used for food production, there are habitats for insects, right? Especially in places where there's so much impervious surface, right? A vacant lot can actually do a lot to a neighborhood. And there's also social different benefits, right? And cultural benefits, everything from recreation, community gardening space, hangout zones, right? This is a picture of the Brooklyn waterfront where a lot of folks congregated over the last few decades, sort of in the ruins of a lot of the industrial remnants of the city and actually made it a really cool space, right? Um, I love Daniel Campo's book, The Brooklyn Waterfront, uh, or The Accidental Playgrounds on the Brooklyn Waterfront, where he documents the history of communities actually um, utilizing a lot of different spaces we would consider novel in New York City. 
And for our friend that's here from Baltimore, from they're just relocated to Austin, right? There's some really great research too coming out of the Baltimore Long-Term Ecological Research Station. Um, Dr. Louis Ziska, who's at the USDA, has been doing um, you know, 20 years worth of research on the impacts of, of different kinds of climate issues to local and non-native plants, right? So he actually set up a, a whole case study where he's looking at different kinds of plants grown in the urban core, one grown just outside of the city, and then one grown on a farm that's about 100 miles from Baltimore. And what he found was that the sort of diversity and actually size of the plants increase in the urban core because there was a higher concentration of carbon dioxide, right? And so they're actually regulating these kind of carbon emissions, but also utilizing it and adapting and growing faster and bigger, right? As compared to outside of the city, right? And so it's, the debate's out if that's good or bad, but it's happening, right? There's a huge, huge dramatic change in the way we think about plants. The study um, that's coming out of Minnesota was looking at um, a kind of an entire oak woodlands ecosystem. And they found that species diversity actually increased with the introduction of naturally occurring plants as opposed to a fully kind of quote unquote native woodland ecosystem. Um, different studies in China, looking at different landscape uses and changes, finding that novel ecosystems provide a ton of benefits, right? To especially highly urbanized areas. This was a study that was done in Poland, looking at different novel ecosystems and how they um, could actually impact soil and insect health in different kinds of disturbed landscapes outside of Krakow. And one of my favorites is coming out of Ohio State University, looking at vacant and disturbed lands and thinking about them as sites for increasing pollinator activity for bees and different kinds of insects. And they're finding that a sort of network of vacant spaces and sort of novel ecosystems provide a really, really crucial, crucial and critical habitat for pollinators, right? And in most cases, what they describe is that these sites would typically be sprayed with pesticide or mowed to the ground, right? That's the only option the city has given is either to kind of make it these wildflower zones or to just completely eliminate them, right? And so we have this kind of key question, right? How do we think about land management strategies now that we have some of this emerging data? Right. Now that's not to say there's not bad things around novel ecosystems, right? There's tons and tons of disservices and trade-offs that we really need to think critically about as well, right? Everything from the disruption of food webs, reductions in biodiversity, different kinds of issues with property owners, right? Agriculture is a big concern, right? Now, a lot of the, the data is sort of difficult to piece together, right? One book that I really recommend checking out is The New Wild by Fred Pierce. And he's a journalist that spent you know, close to five years digging through a lot of the literature and the news on invasive and weedy plants. And what he found was that it's very difficult to actually approve a lot of the numbers that you're seeing out there, right? So the USDA and the Forest and Wildlife Management um, Services estimating billions and billions of dollars, if not trillions of dollars are being um, lost to invasive species management. But what he was able to find was actually that number is not supported empirically um, in the data, right? That we're actually kind of just making a lot of this stuff up based on assumptions of agricultural impacts and economic activity impacts, right? That are not connected to plants. Again, they're connected to human activities and climate issues, right? Has nothing to do necessarily with invasive species, right? So it's, it's really kind of calling us to dis disentangle what we're seeing here. And again, that's not to say that a large swath of kudzu could do a lot of damage, right? And needs to be managed, right? In a reciprocal kind of care-like way too. All right, so I just want to do a quick pause before we get to the last section of today's lecture. And I just want to invite you to close your eyes and take a moment to just think about a plant that you've maybe encountered recently. And to just think about that plant, like what does it look like? What does it feel like? What memories does it bring up for you? If you have anything you wanna share, maybe you could just pop that in the chat. Just take a moment to reposition yourself.
Mm. Thanks for taking a little moment with me. Did I think how to come to mind? See some maidenhood ferns, veggie spring. Oh, I'm sorry, Mary, that happened to you. <laughs> Lots of cleavers. How are we doing generally out there? Is this stuff interesting, connecting with folks? I'm gonna get to a piece where we talk about gardening and also landscape ecology. So hopefully some relevance to all the gardener friends out there. Okay. So I just want to share like a quick case study and then I want to talk about right how do we move forward considering all these big issues here. So at the lab we had this really get like kind of crucial question a few years back. 10% um, of the land area in New York City is considered vacant, right? And that's the largest city in the country, you know, home to close to eight to nine million people, right? What can we potentially do with that, right? Similar to Austin in New York City, you're not allowed to have weeds on your property until fairly recently. Um, herbicide and pesticide use was the main control strategy, right? So there was tons and tons of this chemical being released um, into vacant lots and into urban vacant land more generally, right? And we started to wonder about how we can think differently about um, urban land and urban vacant land in New York. So we set up a study to really understand, right? What were the uses currently of these vacant spaces um, and how are they potentially providing benefits or disservices to particular communities? So the first step in our, our research was really to sort of define all the different kinds of, of functions and uses of different urban vacant land in New York, right? So we took um, a lot of data from the census, from different kinds of public data sets the city had available and started to kind of map um, the, the different typologies of urban vacant land. Um, some of our initial studies were just literally going to visit some of these sites beginning to photograph them and notice, right, all the different kinds of uses that were sort of informal um, from the communities themselves, talking to people on the streets and sort of asking them how they were in relationship to these vacant spaces. And we saw a wide variety of types, right? So some different lots and crowd heights that we discovered in Queens, right, along the Van Wyck Expressway as it juts into the Flushing Bay. And what we decided on in terms of a methodology was actually integrating multiple data sources and leveraging um, Google Earth's um, sort of library of images, satellite images, to really start to look at the different kinds of landscape forms, the different kinds of, of vegetation that were on these sites, and then to really look at um, that as a huge matrix or kind of a complex system in the city. And what we were able to do is to kind of isolate the different kinds of major uses and functions of these sites across the city. And we took a small sample of the, the close to 10 to 20,000 um, vacant sites and parcels across the city, right, as a, as a unit of analysis. And the first thing that we did was start to measure ecosystem services, right? Just like I mentioned before, all the different benefits that are provided ecologically through these sites, right? And you can sort of see, um, you know, these little dots here, the darker they get, right? The higher the sort of benefit is for a particular neighborhood based on the criteria that's on the right here. And then we started to look at the social vulnerability and social sort of systems in the area and to cross-reference them, right? How do these kind of ecological and social systems actually interact and um, inform each other? And what we found was that the clusters of vacant lots, right, especially in areas that had low ecological bio value and high social need, right, these were primarily concentrated in certain areas like East Harlem, and South Bronx, and Central Brooklyn. And so when we started to look at kind of how they matched up with these social vulnerability indicators, this is the map that we were able to kind of come up with. 
And what we found was that 62% of these vacant lands, these urban lands, actually had a huge concentration of, of a dense canopy that is not considered a part of the urban forest, right? It's just kind of separate. The city doesn't kind of recognize it as an actual landscape, but it's providing a lot of really critical ecosystem services to neighborhoods that uh, might be socially vulnerable. And I think more importantly, what we sort of dis you know were discovered is that these vacant lots are a part of a, a sort of more complex urban sort of ecological network of parks, informal green spaces, public green spaces across the city, right? And so uh, these findings suggest that they should be preserved and not necessarily developed, right? Because they provide so many different critical services. So how do we move forward, right? There's a lot of different ways and thinking that are emerging that I think are really interesting, right? Especially this idea of multi-species thinking, multi-species urbanism, multi-species sustainability. So I just wanna kind of touch on that and then talk about how this can trickle down into maybe your gardening practice. So this idea of multi-species thinking isn't really necessarily new. There's lots of really interesting theories and ideas that have emerged over the last you know, 50 to 100 years, right? Just noting, you know, Donna Haraway's, right? The Companion Species Manifesto, where she talks about our sort of inherent relationship with dogs, right? The Multi-Species Salon by Evan Kursky, which really documents this idea of multi-species ethnography. How do we tell the stories of other species, right? And also this idea of post-humanism, right? Thinking about sort of a world beyond human, right? What are the needs and affordances of other species? And more recently, um, there's been a formulation and a kind of a pushback against conventional sustainability frameworks, right? Which again, it's like, you know, people, planet, profits are these three pillars. And what we're finding is that that's actually not a sustainable path forward, right? Like what are we actually sustaining, right? When we have capitalism as one of those pillars. So a lot of researchers and scholars are kind of pushing back against the, the conventional sustainability sort of framework that was um, you know, developed by the UN and the, the kind of Brundtland report back in 1987 and saying that, hey, we actually need multi-species sustainability unless we think about sort of the needs of other species and humans as being interdependent, right? We're not gonna get anywhere, right? So we need to be thinking about the entire sort of biosphere and planetary system as a single whole, right? In order to move forward as a species. And so that has really kind of informed this new idea of multi-species urbanism by right? designing cities, not just for people, but also for other organisms. Um, Deborah Solomon, who's a really cool scholar uh, based in the UK has developed, you know, kind of, kind of coined this term, right? Which you're now seeing used in the literature and also sort of slowly being integrated into city planning around the world, right? And this kind of this a lot of parallels to this idea of the rights to nature movement, personhood status for entire ecosystems, right? And especially um, in the sort of non-Western context, there's lots and lots and lots of indigenous and traditional, you know, sort of viewpoints that have informed this, right? Things like holism and holistic planning, right? You find a lot in Asia and different parts of the world are now informing sort of this, these kind of newer discussions and theories, right? just to kind of give you an example of what multi-species sustainability or thinking looks like, right? There's a few kind of case studies that are now emerging, right? At a Swarthmore College, there's a project called the Healthy Urban Microbiome Initiative, which is really thinking about the design of cities, right? To support microbiotic communities, right? In our, in our bodies and the environment alongside the built environment, which I think is kind of interesting. In Auckland, New Zealand, they've been designing landscapes and gardens from the perspective of a bee. So working with beekeepers and folks who have the expertise in bees and thinking about that as a lens to then inform, you know, sort of a landscape approach or a garden design approach. And even here in Texas, there's a few tinges, right? I'm sure folks are familiar with the, the um, urban back communities in Austin, but the DOT, right, even like 10, 20 years ago, actually adopted this kind of guideline to think about the design of bridges and culverts, right, to actually support that communities um, in different ways. So I think it's, it's really beautiful, not just to think about the roads or bridges for humans, but also it has a habitat for bats. 
And in Massachusetts, there's some really great work being done to really rethink the way we think about fisheries um, and things like oyster, right, harvesting or different kinds of shellfish industries, right? On the left-hand side is a map that's conventionally used by the, the Wildlife Service, the Massachusetts Division of, of Fisheries. And on the right is an alternative mapping that's looking at from the perspective of an oyster, how we can reimagine um, the way that we fish and sort of are in relationship to the sea. And what they were finding is that the oysters, right, that um, are naturally occurring in the area are actually not in conflict with the fishing sort of sites, right, that the fishermen were actually trying to preserve. And so thinking about an oyster perspective helps us to think about mutual relationships as opposed to, you know, keeping them separate. And so this has a lot of implications, right, potentially for gardening, for landscape ecology, and the way we think about urban environments generally, right. So one of the things that I think is really important is this idea of biocultural stewardship, right. And it's a sort of newer but I think old idea that's really about thinking about, you know, kind of cultural traditions, indigenous technologies and ways of knowing and forming stewardship protocols, right? So bringing these things together, right? Thinking about biocultural sort of heritage as a really good pillar, right? To then inform land management practices. And this is being championed by cities all over the world now, really thinking about how can we be pulling from local knowledge to then inform these management strategies. And then that also builds empathy and care, right? Because you're involving people directly in the landscape as opposed to hiring an outside contractor who comes in and sprays the site and then leaves, right? One of the books that I've been looking at um, a lot lately is this book called Planting in a Post-Wild World. And a lot of the strategies and principles that they identify in the book are, you know, kind of, obvious in a lot of ways, but it's nice to see it articulated into a different kind of way of thinking about gardening, right? So the first principle here is to really thinking about less about monocultures, right? I think about diversity of species as supporting each other, right? So it's kind of kind of companion planting gotten mad, um, thinking about stress and disturbance as an asset, right? So not trying to preserve and keep things the way that they are all the time, but really embracing, right? Disturbance in different ways. Um, thinking about this kind of cues to care, right? How do we sort of almost like trick our minds into believing something is beautiful by just simply managing it lightly, right? And then thinking about less about maintenance and more about ongoing care and management, right, in the landscape. So there's just a few photos I'll pull out that I think are really interesting to look at here, even in terms of the way that we think about how we group certain plants or think about different um, sort of elements of a garden kind of coming together less about it being a monoculture and more about it being a diversity of plant species and welcoming weeds in our garden um, because they might, this, they might actually support other species, insects, things that we're not aware of. And so we sort of pay attention. Thinking about time differently, right? Being in relationship to a changing dynamic climate. I'm sure folks are sort of reorienting their practices right, given the sort of fluctuation of extreme weather events, right, how do we sort of fold that into our gardening practices moving forward? And then if we zoom out beyond the garden, right, and think about landscape ecology and more generally, right, how do we design landscapes in cities, there are some really cool ideas emerging too, right, this idea of landscape ecological urbanism, right? That we should design cities through the lens of plants, through the lens of landscapes, right? Is sort of a, a newer but popular idea that is now seen in literature. Um, one sort of interesting case study that I read recently was by Kenneth Baker, and he was doing some really great experiments in the Piedmont area outside of Athens, Georgia, where the university is located, and started to think about this idea of biotype planting, right? So again, thinking about these kind of companion species, these brutal systems as being an asset that we can leverage potentially in landscape design to reduce the amount of maintenance needed and to encourage care, right? And sort of these kind of semi-wild landscapes as being more um, resilient, especially in places that are impacted by climate change. And so he goes through a whole study of looking at um, different sites in Athens and thinking about how we can work together with these rural communities instead of against them. And so this is kind of one of the case studies here is looking at 
this sort of abandoned railroad um, juncture, which you often see a lot in cities is you know, transportation corridors that have been abandoned or underutilized, right? And there are hosts to all different kinds of species and life. So really think about these typologies as being an opportunity to reinvigorate a space, right? Through different kinds of biocultural tactics. And this is kind of another example here too of again, working with all the different elements of the city land, the sort of city system, right? People, cars, you know, different species interacting um, and working with that instead of against it. In the realm of agriculture too, some really interesting sort of ideas, right? Especially emerging from this historic, you know, paradigm of permaculture, right? This idea of regeneration ecology, right? How can we actually leave the lands in a better place than we found it, right? Instead of just trying to mitigate damage or preserving ecosystem services, how do we increase those things through the different methodologies and practices that we take on? Two books that I just want to point out too to end on, um, Tawa Ryan's uh, book, The Beyond the War Invasive Species, and Eric Higgs, Nature by Design, are really kind of interesting um, sort of explorations into restoration ecology. Both of them are re restoration ecologists in different parts of the US and have found that the typical methods and traditional management strategies aren't really working anymore, right? They're just, again, so expensive, so like uh, labor intensive that we start to need to think differently about restoration ecology generally. And so this kind of gives a nice overview of some alternative uh, methods and typologies that are now being um, used even by you know, people like the Forest Service. And then finally for park design too, I think you're seeing some really cool stuff too. Just a few examples, you know, Liberty State Park, even the High Line in Manhattan are some examples of working with rural and novel ecosystems and supporting them. Right, the design of Liberty State Park was pretty controversial because they decided to leave a lot of this untouched and have not really had a huge management plan allowing diversity of species to, to actually thrive. Right, and the assumption was something would just take over, it would be a human health hazard, and it's been the opposite. It's actually a really diverse, um, beautiful park. And then um, another example here in Berlin, right, the Tempelhof Airport Park, which was, um, you know, more or less abandoned, you know, when the the wall came down between East and West Berlin and left this huge kind of remnant in the heart of the city. And the city decided to work with people, right? The communities around that area to decide a use for it. They turned it into a park um, that is more um, semi-wild than wild or semi-wild than, than sort of manicured. And it actually is kind of thriving and supporting all different kinds of ecological and social functions, um, which I think is really kind of cool. All right, so lots of things to chew on. Um, I think I'm going to end it there. And, you know, my parting insights here is just how can we think about weeds, right, as a partner in regeneration, as a partner, right, in thinking about gardening as opposed to a villain that we need to, to um, vanquish, right? Um, and I think there's a lot of possibility to hope in weeds that we can potentially learn from. So, I'll end it there. Um, if y'all want to get in touch, I'm happy to answer questions um, or talk a little bit more about some of this too. Thank you, Chris. That was so yeah. comprehensive and informative. It wasn't too much, sorry. No, no. <laughs> Typically working with grad students, so this is yeah, that was some great. of my lectures here. It's a good thing for us to think about at the beginning of the year, especially when we kind of went through this freeze and everything cycling back. And it's a time for us to really think about it's good for us to think about all of these things and um, uh, in our own backyards and then how we can, you know, make it important in our broader communities yeah. uh, by having these conversations, you know, with uh, larger members, people that may be able to change code and things in the city. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would love if any, there's any GIS map people out there been trying to figure out a way to map the urban vacant land and get that data set, which I know is some of it's on the Travis County website and the Austin's um, yeah. public access data, but folks want to collaborate, I'd love to make a yeah. map and just to kind of see like how much land are we talking about here? What can we potentially work yeah. with? My, a friend of ours, Henna, she works in water with the city and she's, we've mm. done some mushroom mapping 
projects. So yes. I think she would be, I want to introduce you to her. Okay. She would be very interested in this. And she's done some things with like um, layering uh, water quality data with uh, the social, with uh, economic disparity data. So she already right. is thinking in that same space about, um, you know, the, the economic and social disparities within the city and the quality right. of life and the resources available. Totally. I really think that code videos, interesting how, um, they assume that the person who wants to grow their yard is doing it kind of randomly, not because they want pollinators or they want mm -hmm. to grow long grasses for carbon sequestration, or they, they have no knowledge. But, um, and the, and the code police really do bug, bug people, you know, when they try to do stuff. But um, a few years ago, I, I got the sent in for the certified wildlife habitat sign. And I put that out. Yes. And it's been working. The power um, of a sign, it is real. I have I really yeah. recommend that. <laughs> it's like wildlife habitat and it's fifty dollars or I don't know, yeah. something. You can get a little metal sign and put it out front and mm -hmm. um, you know, it helps with the city understand that you are trying to provide habitat with, you know, and you have to actually do water and you have to do all the things that they say in the habitat thing. Yeah. So it was good. But um, I think that the city needs a revamp as far as um, that those ideas, and and it would be it would be great if you had a if you gave the city a lecture tailed to why it's important to revamp these ideas about a a, a twelve inch lawn, mm -hmm. and that um, maybe they could have some sort of different way of um, of approaching that problem, yeah. because I think long grasses are important. Uh, for carbon sequestration and if we yeah. grew things grass that was not necessarily the grass that you know, right. you know yeah. but uh, the kind of grass that has long roots you know yeah. and and uh, the city educated people on that and uh, it became more of a uh, something that was discussed um, mm -hmm. uh, there was a discussion with the city about how, changing those code ideas uh -huh. um, and I think your lecture really pinpoints a lot of that and uh, I think you should consider uh, giving them a lecture and maybe <laughs> talking about the codes and, and doing a little research on that and how they could change those ideas. And they, I think they'd be open to it. I, I, I really recommend that if yeah. you're interested in, in pursuing yeah. Even just doing an ecosystem service, you know, sort of analysis would be really nice just to understand mm -hmm. what are the potential benefits. Yeah. I happen to live by a grow zone, which I noticed is a thing here, which is really cool. And the city got a different mower contractor or something. And so it inadvertently like mowed down half of this grow zone, which was, you know, an area on a, like a sort of creek side. Mowed, yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh my God, why would you do this? To my, it's a grow my zone. Little, and know. that's a whole other thing too, is that landscapers need education about what I is know. a better way to, to landscape. Because, you know, I, I've had lots of conversations because the places I've worked where landscapers have come in and just destroyed. Mm -hmm. what the work is ongoing um and landscapers don't have continuing education or yeah you know they're 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 really they they're a population that really needs to have more knowledge about and i take the time when i con when i when i'm with one of them and they it's, sometimes it's in spanish <laughs> you know and i sit there and i talk about you know what the different concepts are and how they're important, how they should think about changing the way they landscape. And it's worth the effort. And I, I wish there was more of a way to r reach that group of people about how to landscape differently. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. these are important concepts. Yeah, maybe there's one out there, but I've been talking to some friends about making a sort of feral wild design landscape um, guide or just like a simple you know, thing that you can hand somebody. Um, oh, sometimes yes, just yes. having an object is so important to just see a picture. They're like, oh, I get it. <laughs> you know, and um, Spanish, because a lot right, of yes. are, Span are Spanish speaking. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah, yeah. Translated, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I know, isn't um, uh, he's the host of Central Texas Gardener, like John Hart Asher? He's really big into Forbes and grasses, um, you know, and he's become, I think, a real advocate of 
you know, pocket prairies and people thinking along those lines, but I don't know if people think of it as their front yard, it can be <laughs> turned into like a grassland or a, a prairie. <laughs> yes. I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's oftentimes it's like literally no cost, right? You don't have to do anything, <laughs> which I think is kind of beautiful, but you know, important to know it's not, it's out of reach for some people, right? And so even just the unlearning process can be tricksy and we have to think about like who has access to those capacities and time and that could be an important consideration too. What's pretty, what's- an pretty? HOA, that's like yeah. a whole thing. <laughs> oh my God. I know I'm renting my house currently and they make us mow the lawn. I swear I reluctantly get somebody to come by every few weeks, but it's always, it's always like, why can't you just leave it alone? <laughs> it looks fine to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, what brings you down here? <laughs> <laughs> well, my partner's from here originally. And after 15 years of being in New York and, you know, a year of COVID and living in a one bedroom apartment, we realized we needed more space. <laughs> so it was like a kind of coming home for him. And, um, and I just was really wanted to have a garden. She's like, you can't do that easily in New York. <laughs> my daughter so. actually went to school at Parsons School of Design. Oh, amazing. Yes. <laughs> Sorry for the cost, but hopefully you're going to get pretty good scholarships. But okay, good. Okay, the good. cost of living was very high. <laughs> it's not easy. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, awesome. Yeah. Does anybody else uh, want to speak up, uh, unmute or un show your video and have a question? Um, I do. Okay. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. So, um, my husband and I have gotten older and we used to have um, a vegetable garden in the backyard when we were much younger. And we both have had medical issues, but we have a half acre yard just because of the way this cul-de-sac was situated. And over, gosh, I guess maybe, maybe over five, 10 years, I'd say, um, the whole backyard looks like Austin green space, you know, not, not, a, not cultured at all, just whatever blew in, you know, and all of these trees and everything that's come up. And um, my question is, um, to, does it, you know, is that just great, just the way it is? Or is there like a progression? I've heard the, of a, you know, a progression between um, trees and fungal diversities and then you know it goes up, on up until bacterial where you can you know vegetable garden and do all those other kind of things so is it best just to leave it I mean I don't know what kind of we what kind of so-called weeds are back there you know there's so many different things and I love it I love just walking back there in whatever you know whatever comes out it's a, it's a really good question. And, um, you know, I, my reaction is that it wouldn't be good or bad, right? It's, it's happening. Um, and a lot of what I've been reading about is, is about this idea of thinking about care differently, right? And so maybe it's just a simple practice of noticing that you can really embrace to sort of see if there's one particular plant, right, that is, is you know, exploding or or finding, um, you know, a space in that that area that you feel like it maybe is concerned, then just pinpoint, hey, like this seems a little bit right. This the stability maybe of the the system is is shifting, um, and because that could have implications for the neighboring property, right, on some level. Um, but I don't necessarily think it needs to be sprayed with herbicide, right? And so it's finding that balance of of care and attention but also letting things naturally sort of unfold, I think is important. Um, so I would just keep my eye out. If you notice like one species is all of a sudden dominating, then we have a monoculture, right? And we have the same right. problem of an industrial agriculture system, right? right. One thing being prioritized over others. Um, is, is, the, um, is, is what's happening naturally out there, nature, trying to heal the situation or trying to make the soil better? You know, is it doing stuff out there that's, um, you know, trying to make it more beneficial? Mm -hmm. 
or it, is that, do you understand what I'm saying? I don't know if I'm not a very good communicator. Yeah, I think that most scientists would say it's a form of, of adaptation, right? Ecological adaptation and, and what plants are learning to do. And it's on a different time scale, right? It's not in human time. They're adapting to us, right? To a changing climate, to increased urbanization. Even if you're in a suburban, more rural area, the impacts are still there. And so plants are actually amazing and genius. They learn how to shift, right? They're their traits, their functions, their hybridized, right? It's actually being in relationship to us. Um, and so that's what you're seeing. And so it's it's not necessarily, it could be bad or it could be beneficial, but mm -hmm. it's, um, it is a form of adaptation. And when we think about, you know, plants in Europe, right? It's that, you know, we find here that we think are invasive and weedy, right? In Europe, they've actually have a longer history of adapting to urban spaces, right? And so things that were once considered non-native are now all of a sudden native there, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just a kind of a sense of time, actually. Yeah. Um, There's a, a group called, I think Texas Flora or Fauna yeah. or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you can actually post to that group the things that you have in your yard and um, have them identified. And oh, wow. so you can kind of know um, what's happening there. People are really good in that group to go, oh, that's a blah, blah, blah. and that's not native or that is native or whatever it is. And um, I would take that one out because it's gonna, it's poisonous or whatever. Uh -huh. they're, they're very good about identifying and helping with that. And there's some plant, you might be able to get somebody to help you just walk through your place and help you kind of say, well, you know, if you want this to over the long term have better this or more drainage or whatever, they might help you. There's some experts in that group that would be great a great resource to ask those kind of questions so you can kind of maybe shape what you have over time in a way that um, um, is more beneficial yeah. or whatever it is you're trying to achieve with that what was the name of that again what i think it, i think it's called texas, texas flora. flora i'll pick the link group. the link in the yeah. chat what's that i'll put the link in the chat oh thank you so much texas flora yeah it's a Facebook group. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question, June. Thanks for asking. Anyone else have a question? Yeah, I kind of had a question that I was thinking about whenever, uh, based on June's question too. And I know, you know, I've heard little things here and there more in conversation with friends and plant plant people, um, and this isn't so much about like urban systems, but some of the indigenous systems that we kind of look at as wild, right? So like things like the Amazon forest, there's this notion that it just was there and it was not, there wasn't like um, human uh, humans in habitat and like working with the plants and just thinking about, you know, what, what can we learn about that uh, indigenous food ways um, of the past when people were living in harmony and finding ways to like cultivate and grow the sort of Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. um, how can we do that in our urban spaces? Um, and I know I see things like the food forests and everything like that growing up. And I know there's a lot of challenges and there's a huge learning curve there as well. Um, but in your research, have you come across anything kind of looking at like, um, you know, I know you cited like some of uh, Klimmer's book, um, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's like, it's complicated in a lot of ways, but the, the term that I would maybe search for is this idea of biocultural, right? Biocultural stewardship and, and even this kind of notion of cultural landscapes, right? A lot of people argue that since the beginning of human history, we have always been in relationship to, to plants and to landscapes, right? There's, there's kind of always been a human sort of um, emphasis and, and pressure on systems. And necessarily, it's not a good or bad thing, right? It's just, it's happening. Um, in a lot of ways, it can be beneficial, like the taking care of forests and different kinds of ecosystems or landscapes can actually be really amazing because humans are there and involved. Um, but this kind of you know old but emerging idea of biocultural strategies, right? Pulling from indigenous cultural traditions to then inform stewardship practices has become a lot more popular. 
Um, in New York City, the New York City Parks Department has regular sort of check-ins with um, members of indigenous tribe, tribal communities um, in the area. And they say, hey, like what's going on? Like where you might be just outside the city or where you used, you know, just learning from your ancestors to then have that trickle down into management strategies um, at the city level. I think it's really cool, but it's at the long-term process, it takes 10 years, right? to develop trust, to develop relationships, to have the conversations, to then convince the people that have the budget to be like, okay, no longer we're gonna use herbicide on this thing, right? Because we know this plant is actually really um, a cool medicinal use, or maybe it has a social value, right? Um, and to be more sort of nuanced in, in how we think about that. But you know, for folks who make decisions, if it takes more time and it costs more money, right? The automatic response is no, right? And so I think it's a lot of times it's about convincing folks that um, it's all doable within those constraints. Um, and it actually can be a lot more, um, you know, advantageous long-term, right? Because you get people involved and they start taking care of the landscape, you know, on their own volition, right? There's an accountability and trust that's built um, through those processes. I think that's what's missing is that we just assume we can hire a contractor or a landscaper to come fix the mess, right? And when we're really just kind of yeah, staving off the problem. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, and I think like we've designed our world to not allow us to have time, right? To have time to be in a relationship to a plant and just to like go outside and listen and notice and be still um, mm -hmm. to put your feet on the soil, right? That's, that's often not a part of our everyday practices anymore. Um, and so it's oftentimes an invitation to, to return, right, to that. Absolutely. Amazing. Did uh, anyone else have a question tonight before we sign off? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have had such a good time with this. It was a, I yeah. felt crammed. Yeah, sorry if it was too much, y'all. <laughs> no, it was quite good. It was very informative. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciated it. Of course. Yes. Yeah, thank you, too. Chris, so much. Yes. We enjoyed it. And we are so happy you're here. Yes. I, was, Thanks I was just going to say that, too. I'm from Brooklyn originally, born and raised. And oh, yes. I'm uh, 68 now, so it's nice to hear a little bit of what's going on in the city. And I remember yeah. so many vacant lots that were just, you know, vacant lots that had stuff growing in them or whatever. But uh, uh, thank you for coming here too. Having a strategy for that, I think, is brilliant. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's all possible. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it seems like to me that um, you know, just branching out little by little by talking to your neighbors and things like that. You know, for your very very local community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're talking about getting people who have power to um, convince them and um, like. It was like we live in um, Andersonville. I don't know if you know where that is, Northwest Austin. And, um, you know, just a community um, facility. I, I don't remember what they call it. Neighborhood, like a neighborhood organization, you know, that yeah, yeah. decides on things to do with your parks and stuff. Yeah. I know for me, um, because there were so many trees in the backyard, I've been doing stuff in the front yard, making... Um, planting beds that kind of are curvy and go along with with the landscape so it doesn't look so wild but it's actually my vegetable garden <laughs> <laughs> i love that <laughs> and, that's great you know, just so it it'll be more palatable to everyone yeah, yeah. well thanks again everybody it's so uh, wonderful hope you all see you out on the streets of austin <laughs> yeah, looking at we we. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to sign off. Thank you so much again, yes. and uh, have a great rest of reading. And uh, really appreciate you coming out. Yes, of course. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Chris. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.